Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all well and welcome to our webinar on hip and knee surgery. My name is Morella and I'll be your host for this evening. Our expert presenter is consultant orthopaedic surgeon, Mr. Alex Chipperfield. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. So if you'd like to ask a question during or after the presentation, please do so via the Q&A icon, which is on the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without your giving your name. If you would like to book your consultation, we have Chelsea Dan from the private patients team on hand to take phone calls after the webinar, and we'll provide the number at the end of this session. Please do note the webinar is being recorded. I'll hand over now to Mr Chipperfield and you'll hear from me again shortly. Hello there. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming along today and signing in. Um, my name is Alex Chipperfield. I am a consultant orthopaedic surgeon here at Benenden Hospital. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, hip and knee pain, hip and knee replacement surgery, uh, really. Um, normally, when we do this, there, there are two of us. One of us talks about hips and one about knees. But um, unfortunately, tonight, you've got me for both. So I'm um, sorry about that. Uh, a little bit about me. I've been a doctor now for the last 25 years. I studied medicine in London and I trained uh, as a surgeon in the southeast of England. I then went to Australia and performed uh, to, to, to do a, a fellowship in hip and knee surgery. And since coming back from there, I've been a consultant surgeon performing hip and knee surgery in Kent for the last 12 and a bit years. Um, I've started working at Benenden around 10 years ago as part of the orthopaedic con consortium providing uh, hip and knee surgery here. I am a member of the British Orthopaedic Association and Hip Society, and I perform primary and revision hip and knee replacements as part of my routine practice. Um, I suppose I'm what you could call a high volume surgeon. Um, when you're looking for someone who to, to perform your hip or knee replacement, you want to see, you want to make sure that they are, have enough experience and uh, perform the surgery on a routine basis. Uh, these figures that you can see here, these give my, my uh, national joint registry data, the most recent data from the report published this year, showing that um, I perform approximately uh, three times the number of the national average of both hip and knee replacements. So I know what I'm doing. Um, hip and knee surgery at our hospital, we're the leading provider of hip and knee treatments in Kent and Sussex. Um, if any of you have been to the hospital in the last five years, you'll appreciate that it is a, it's a lovely building. Um, it's all been refurbished and rebuilt uh, in you know around 2017-18 uh, it's a clean it's a calm environment there's a good team around there's an experienced team of uh, surgeons physios nurses theatre staff and all of that leads to very high patient satisfaction rates uh, one of the things that we're famous for in the area is a, a rapid recovery program to to get people up and out of hospital um, uh, as rapidly as possible following their surgery um, I mentioned high volume surgeons. Um, the other important thing is uh, high volume units. You want to have your hip replaced or your knee replaced in uh, in a facility that has that, that that performs these on a regular basis. This um, again from the National Joint Registry of this year, looking at the number of hip and knee uh, replacements. Uh, with Benenden at the top, then compared to uh, other other local hospitals, whether it be the uh, NHS and the uh, Kent and Canterbury Hospital, or private hospitals such as the, the the Chaucer Hospital in Canterbury or the Spire Montefiore down in uh, Brighton and Sussex. So, we perform a lot of this kind of surgery here. We've got a good unit set up um, dedicated for this kind of treatment. Um, first thing I'm going to talk about tonight is is total hip replacement. So we'll we'll touch on the uh, signs and symptoms of arthritis of the hip. We'll go through the the, the patient journey really, just um, talk you through what will happen in your consultation, go through various different treatment options available, and then talk about the the surgery and how we 
make things better and uh, we also talk about potential problems relating to um, hip surgery once we've done that we'll then do the same with knees um, so generally arthritis of the hip wear and tear of the hip tends to be what we call osteoarthritis which is a of a, a gradual onset of no specific single cause um, it's when the the normally smooth surfaces that glide over each other that form the the hip joint they start to wear away exposing the raw bone underneath and you you go from a situation where you've got a, a frictionless painless joint that glides into a a, a painful stiff joint that creaks and cracks and uh, causes a lot of discomfort there's no specific single cause for osteoarthritis it's multifactorial there are uh, many risk factors such as uh, previous injury or weight or occupation <coughs> um, but the, uh, the the biggest uh, risk factor is family history if you come from a from a from a family that has uh, bad hips or bad knees or both then there's a high probability that you're gonna uh, end up in the same same way later on um, there is no cure for osteoarthritis there's no pill that you can take that will make it disappear or go away there are many different treatments that you can have for it that allow your symptoms to become manageable and tolerable um, and most of those symptoms most of those um, treatments are what we call conservative treatments so treatments that don't involve surgery um, joint preserving treatments um, should all of those conservative measures fail, then looking at um, surgery in the form of a hip replacement. Um, in the UK, the average age for someone to have a hip replacement is 69 years old. Um, that age is dropping and it's certainly not, not, a, not a limit. Um, I performed hip replacements on people, anything from 20 to over 100 and Ultimately, it boils down to when your symptoms are bad enough and uh, as long as you're fit and healthy enough to have the surgery. Uh, the consult consultation itself uh, mainly will involve a lot of talking, uh, predominantly you talking to me, um, uh, what's called uh, taking a history. So listening to the the, the story of, of your problems going from uh, how, how things have come about, how they affect you and generally building up a picture of, of how the how the worn out hip or knee is uh, impacting on your life and uh, whether it's stopping you from uh, doing anything that you that you enjoy doing or having an impact on your work or general mental health and well-being there will then be a physical examination this uh, is designed to see exactly how worn or otherwise the, the the joint may be look at the strength and the patency of the muscles and ligaments and nerves that support and supply the the joint but also looking for other causes of your pain uh, symptoms in and around the hip joint may not come from the hip they may be indicative of a of a back problem or of a soft tissue problem and it's important to exclude or confirm these um, before proceeding with surgical intervention. Um, we then look at the imaging available. We look at x-rays or scans that you may or may not have already had. Uh, often people will come along to the hospital having been investigated elsewhere and it's a fairly simple procedure to have those uh, scans transferred electronically onto the hospital system so that we are able to look at them together and I can talk you through any, any particular findings. Um, if there are no scans or imaging available, then we do have a, a, a modern imaging suite at the at, at Benenden where we can take x-rays and scans as appropriate and those special tests we can then look at and go through to uh, reach a, a, a diagnosis. Once we've done all that, then there will be a, a, a shared decision making process really to, to tailor the treatment that um, is best for you at that particular time in life. Um, treatment options, uh, they, they, they vary from, from simple things that you can do for yourself, such as uh, losing weight or uh, doing exercise, which is a, generally a very good thing to try and strengthen the, the muscles and ligaments uh, that can support a, a failing joint. 
uh, non-operative treatments, including uh, physiotherapy and occupational therapy and pain relief, uh, activity modifications. Um, other options uh, would include uh, injections in or around the, the hip joint. Um, there are many soft tissue problems around the hip joint that can be dealt with rapidly and easily in the clinic environment with an injection. If we're looking at doing an injection into the hip joint itself, then this is something that's best performed in an operating theatre under uh, X-ray guidance. So that's a, a more invasive procedure. Um, I've mentioned physio, then, then we'd be looking at if all of those conservative and, and invasive procedures fail, then the only thing left when it comes to arthritis of the hip would be a, a hip replacement. There are no smaller operations uh, that, that, that work uh, to, to preserve a hip joint. Once your hip looks like this person's uh, right hip here, um, then there really is no choice. Um, if you can't live with it, there really is no choice other than hip replacement surgery. The surgical journey itself starts um, with prehabilitation. Um, it's best for people to, to be as strong and as healthy and as mobile as they possibly can be prior to their surgery. It means that they will get through their surgery more quickly and they will be able to recover uh, in a more rapid way. Uh, you will then have a, a, a pre-assessment appointment that will be where you see the nurses and the physios and often you'll see the anaesthetist at this stage as well to discuss the, the, the kind of anaesthetic that you will be having for your surgery. The pre-assessment is very important. It's uh, designed to make sure that you are fit and healthy enough to have your surgery and also to make sure that it's appropriate to have your surgery here at Benenden. Um, once that, that pre-optimization and that pre-assessment process uh, is, 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 is done, then you will come in for your for your operation. Um, the rapid recovery program that we use here at Benenden um, starts at that pre-assessment appointment. Um, your, your recovery is much quicker and much better if we start that process before the actual operation itself. So you'll get a good idea of what's expected of you before, during and after your hospital stay. Um, the hospital stay at Stealth, you will be admitted on the day of the surgery. Um, operating, we, we, we operate all day here at Benenden um, and on weekends as well. Um, our, our surgical sessions tend to be split into morning and afternoon sessions. So you may well be asked to come here uh, first thing in the morning or you may find that you, you get admitted to the ward at late morning or lunchtime if you're not going to have the operation until the afternoon. Your hip replacement will generally be under what's called a spinal anaesthetic where you have an injection into the lower part of your back. This will put your legs to sleep. Um, on top of that you will be offered sedation that means that as well as your legs being asleep you won't be aware of what's going on around you. Some people don't want to be sedated in any way and are quite happy to uh, talk and chat throughout their surgery. Um, personally I can't think of anything worse. I'd much rather be asleep um, but those both options are available to you. Um, typically you'll have a, a one or two night stay in hospital. Uh, really that depends on how quickly you, you get up and about and you're finding your feet after the operation. Uh, it's becoming more common for people to be discharged home the day after a hip replacement, um, but it's by no means mandatory. Um, we, If you have your surgery in the morning, we will have you standing up uh, on the day of the operation. Uh, it's important that you're fully weight bearing from day one, even if it's just standing or walking across the room, it means that the morning after the surgery, you, you have the confidence, you know that that hip is already, you know it's sound, you know it's solid, you know it will bear your weight. And the, the focus of the hospital stay will be intensive physiotherapy and nursing care to ensure that your uh, pain is under control and your mobilization is progressing well.
Your, the medical team at, at Benenden, uh, you'll be, there's a resident medical officer who uh, is there to look after your um, immediate medical needs. There is also an on-call team who are uh, available 24 seven for uh, more urgent matters. And of course, you'll see your consultants again um, after, the, uh, after the surgery whilst you're in hospital. You, when you are at the stage where you are safe to go home, you will have had some x-rays, you will have had blood tests, um, you'll be up and about and dressed and mobilising and you'll be happy and safe transferring in and out of cars, going up and down stairs and you'll be, you'll have passed your driver's licence with your crutches as well. So once all of those boxes are ticked and the physios and nurses and you're happy with your progress, then you'll be discharged. That could be day one post-op or it may well be day two. One of the things that you uh, that you will be given is that you will be given a course of uh, anticoagulants. So these are medications that are designed to minimise but not exclude the risk of blood clots um, following surgery. For a hip replacement, you'll be given a prescription of these for four weeks. If we're if we're talking about knee replacement, then you'll have a two week supply. These uh, in the old days, these used to be injections, um, which people uh, tend not to enjoy being given uh, so now there are oral uh, tablet versions that uh, most people are a lot more comfortable with taking you will have physiotherapy as an outpatient and you will be uh, seen and reviewed again in the clinic by your surgeon at about six weeks down the line uh, we're very aware that many people uh, travel quite significant distances to have their surgery here at Benenden um, traveling home is generally not a, not a problem. Um, I personally am more than happy to follow people up uh, with a telephone or video consultation remotely at the six week stage rather than uh, a, a long journey to come back to see us here at Benenden. But either way, whichever works for you, uh, we're happy with. Um, at that six week appointment, sorry, I'll just have a drink. At that six week appointment, Appointment. We'll um, look at your wound. Typically, that's a picture that someone's taken from the internet. There, that's uh, what a hip replacement wound will look like at about six weeks post-op. So it'll still be a little bit red and lumpy, and uh, that's completely normal. It's part of a, a, a normal healing process. Generally, at the six-week stage, half the people I see are, are are using some kind of walking aid, whether it be a crutch or a stick. But half of the people that I see are walking completely unaided at that stage. Um, it is generally safe to drive again. Most people, the average time uh, following a hip replacement that they that they they get back behind the wheel is around six weeks. That tends to be because that's the time that people ask their surgeon whether or not they can drive. Um, essentially, what it boils down to is that you have to be able to get in and out of the car safely. You have to be able to not be under the influence of any mind altering drugs or strong painkillers and you have to be able to control the car uh, this is a, a right hip scar if you've had a right hip replacement then you need to be able to stamp on the brakes without hesitation um, before you can drive safely and a lot of people will find that that is around six weeks that that can happen but like i say that is an average time and individuals will uh, will vary there's been talk of hip precautions on this um even when i started uh, surgery so not that long ago well, I like to think not that long ago um surgeons were very strict on what they allowed patients to do in the immediate post-operative period there was a big list of, of do's and don'ts not bending too much not performing certain ac activities following hip replacement and there's been a trend over over the years um with with modern implants uh with lessened risk of dislocation or, or potential problems there's been a, a relaxation of uh hip precautions uh, but the, you will still find that um if you read your preoperative booklets there will be general advice of things that are safer to try and avoid if at all possible um in the early post-operative period but by the time you come back at six weeks then those precautions will be fully uh, relaxed. There are um, complications and problems that can arise with any major operation. 
um, and a hip replacement is no exception. Uh, there's a risk of infection. Uh, infection is at the top, not because it's the commonest uh, problem, but because it can be one of the one of the worst. Uh, surgeon, orthopedic surgeons in particular, we we uh, are meticulous to avoid uh, infection, and everything that we do during and after the surgery is designed to minimise that risk. But it's still can happen. The infection rate at Benenden is uh, less than 1%, which is better than the national average and certainly uh, a lot better than most other local hospitals. Um, there's a risk of blood clots. I spoke about uh, medicine to prevent you getting blood clots. Um, that those, those tablets are one of what we call a multi, multimodal approach. So one of very many different measures that we use to try and minimize the, the risk of blood clots following this surgery. But despite all those, blood clots can still happen and you can get a blood clot in your leg, um, which can be more of an inconvenience than anything else. Or you can rarely, but unfortunately it is a possibility, you can get a blood clot in the lung, which can be a lot more serious. Um, there is a risk of nerve injury with any operation that involves cutting around nerves. Uh, there can be swelling or bleeding or bruising or pressure on the nerves, and that can result in numbness or loss of function. Again, vanishingly rare when you're talking about um, modern hip replacement surgery. Uh, dislocation I've touched on before, uh, the uh, artificial hips uh, are vulnerable in the early stages to dislocation um, while the soft tissues and muscles uh, are, are healing and strengthening around um, uh, uh, hip replacement then there is a risk of dislocation if you are unlucky or the um, or the, the things work their way loose or you have a, an injury so that can happen leg length discrepancy um, your legs can feel longer or shorter before an operation and uh, can go the other way after the surgery. Quite often people's legs, are, as part of the, 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 the process when your hip wears out, uh, there's a combination of real and apparent shortening of your legs. So your the joint can wear and your hip can feel shorter because of that. And also it can stiffen up and that can lead to feelings of a, of a shorter hip. Once, once you've had a hip replacement, then that the, the hip replacement will restore your previous anatomy. So you go from a situation where you felt short to feeling uh, to, to being balanced again, but initially you can feel uh, longer. There is a we, we, we plan surgery beforehand using a computer program to so we, we, we're very accurate in how we make the cuts and how we implant the these the, these things. So the, the chances of a, a significant bothersome leg length discrepancy that requires further intervention is again vanishingly small. Um, artificial joints can wear out. Um, that tends to happen over the course of many years, uh, decades. Modern implants are designed to last an incredibly long time and certainly if you're talking about having a hip replacement at the average age so at a, as a 69 year old, if you have a modern hip replacement that is performed technically well and you don't have any unfortunate medical complications, then I would anticipate that that replacement would last you the rest of your life. Um, a lot of people that find the decision as to whether or not they want to go down the surgical route can be quite difficult. Um, there are many different uh, decision making tools out there. I've mentioned the National Joint Registry. Uh, that's a, a very useful online resource that will tell you a lot about surgeons and a lot about hospitals and also a lot about whether or not it's the right thing for you to do to have a hip replacement. And it's uh, worthwhile looking at the National Joint Registry patient support tools that can uh, take you through that process with a simple questionnaire. Um, you can look at the uh, PHIN, which is a, a, an online resource looking at the, that rates um, private hospitals and give you an idea of the kind of activity levels and feedback. There are also um, lots of review sites. Um, every, you can review everything these days, and I'm no exception. I get reviewed on a regular basis. 
um, by patients on these websites. Uh, so there's a website called Doctify, which uh, you'll see uh, signs for around Benenden. And there's also websites called Top Doctors as well. So you can look at all of these and you'll see when you click on them, you'll get these kind of things, these, these profiles. There's the top uh, Doctify on the left, Top Doctors on the right. Sorry, I've used the same photo for both, but you can read all my five star reviews or look at look at everyone else around and look at the, the kind of reviews and feedback that people have been left uh, over the over the uh, weeks and months preceding. So it's quite a useful thing to to get to know your surgeon before you meet them. Um, here is this is a, a video. This is one of our uh, previous patients talking about uh, their their hip replacement experience here at Benenden. So I'm just going to let that play. I'll just stop my my feed for a minute, and so you can um, concentrate on them. <laughs> How I was feeling before was very, 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 very nervous. I've never um, experienced anything like this before. I don't know what I was worried about at all. I felt no pain. Um, there was no discomfort at all, so I don't know what I was worried about. Um, as, as far as I would suggest to anyone that's been offered that sort of um, treatment, go ahead 100%. I was in the hospital for only the day and um, I was up walking two and a half hours after the operation. I felt as if I could run a marathon, in all fairness. I'm hoping to be out there Sunday playing golf. I'm going back to work tomorrow, so everything's okay. okay Don't put it off and as far as where you go to, you cannot beat Benedict Hospital. There you go, uh, completely unbiased um, video there from Andy talking about how he got on following his surgery. Um, he did mention going back to work. Uh, that's something that um, we often get asked, uh, how, how long should I take off work? I advise people um, to, to, to say that they're not gonna be at work for around two or three months following their operation. Um, now, most people feel that they can get back to work sooner than this. But what you don't want to be is you don't want to be under pressure um, getting back to work, whether that is from yourself or from your work. You, you, this is a big operation. And although you will be up and about and in hospital very uh, for a brief period of time, it's still big surgery and you do need time to recover both physically and mentally from this. And in order to recover, um, best you don't you don't want to be under the extra pressure of worrying about having to get to work on monday as well so that's just my advice as far as that goes um whoop, got rid of andy sorry moving on now to uh knee replacement so a knee replacement uh, again the the number one reason that we perform knee replacements here at Benenden and anywhere in the country, the number one is that that wear and tear, that osteoarthritis. The, um, um, and again, the same the same as the hip. That is a that is a multifactorial uh, problem that generally is related to life, to injuries, to weight, and to uh, family history. Uh, so all of those things will contribute to the development of arthritis. Um, there are other conditions that can also lead to a, a knee being worn out. Uh, there are so-called inflammatory arthritis. So these are the ones, they're not the wear and tear ones, they're the diseases that where your own body um, attacks the, the joints. Um, uh, inflammatory arthritis such as rheumatoid arthritis um, or, or, or gout or uh, that, that kind of thing. Um, it's been interesting the uh, seeing the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis in, in, in people needing knee replacements over the years. Again, 20, 25 years ago when I started, about one in three knee replacements were performed for rheumatoid arthritis. Now it's much rarer that people get to that stage. There's been a revolution in as far as um, 
uh, drug treatments for rheumatoid arthritis have gone and uh, it's it's a much uh, the the, those medications have saved many people with rheumatoid uh, arthritis from from worn out knee joints. It still does happen, uh, but yeah, significantly less common than it used to be. Uh, there are certain injuries that can predispose you to needing a knee replacement. Uh, the classic one is what's called a tibial plateau injury. That's where you break the bone that makes up part of the, the, the knee joint and uh, that can predispose you to rapid onset of post-traumatic arthritis, um, even if it is uh, treated surgically at the time. Uh, ligament injuries can also uh, uh, lead you to develop arthritis more rapidly. Uh, these, both those ligament and broken bone injuries, they've, it's very rare for them to lead to immediate knee replacement. What we're talking about is the, the hastening of the onset of the arthritic change in the knee. Um, the aim of a knee replacement, again, is to, to relieve the pain, to allow you to get up and about more, to, to increase the mobility. Um, it's quite common with, with knee arthritis for people to get deformities of the knee. Um, people end, can end up uh, severely knock-kneed or, or bandy-legged or have uh, permanently bent knees and all of these things you uh, will attempt to part of the the knee replacement surgery will will involve realigning that joint to to correct those those deformities that have come on as a result of the arthritic change um, again with knee replacements as with hip replacements the patient population the age at, we, at which people are having this surgery is getting lower and lower there are uh, um, again, at the moment, the average age is mid to late 60s, but it's um, I'm seeing more and more people in their 50s and younger um, with completely worn out knees. And th these are uh, uh, the, the, these people are uh, uh, almost a different subset, uh, younger, higher demand patients who still want to undergo sporting activities to a higher level, uh, high expectations there. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure. Um, on them and on the surgery and the implant to to get people back to uh, their previous uh, level of functions and uh, some people uh, some people's expectations do need to be managed when it comes to this artificial joints will not allow you to lead a completely normal life without restriction there will be some high demand and uh, high demand activities that will be difficult if not impossible following knee replacement and it's important that you're aware of that uh, before the surgery uh, this is a picture of the the knee replacement that we use here at Benenden it's called the Vanguard uh, knee replacement um, knee replacements themselves like I say they're common we do a, a, a thousand of them here and there are a hundred thousand of them performed every year here at Benenden again I've spoken about the the average age and again hugely successful operation with the overwhelming majority of people are, are, are pleased with the results and again these are things that last for decades um vanguard knee replacement there are many different brands of knee replacement there are four or five big orthopedic implant manufacturers in this country and each of those manufacturers will have several different models or versions of knee replacements it's like cars really it's like the all the big uh, manufacturers have lots of different models and the same same thing is is true with with knee replacements um and sometimes it, it people ask how you choose which implant which knee replacement which hip replacement should you have um essentially what you want is one that is proven to work you want one that has a a, a track record you want one that's going to last you the rest of your life um hip replacements knee replacements orthopedic implants they are all monitored they are uh, monitored by joint registries both in the uk and globally and from that huge amount of data that is out there we can we can monitor the implants that perform well and the implants that don't perform well the vanguard knee replacement is one of the ones that performs incredibly well throughout the globe and lasts an incredibly long time there are new innovations and new designs that are coming onto the market all the time um, and it's a tricky situation with 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 new things because you again 
new you want you want modern implants but you also want ones that are proven to last and work so finding the balance between those two it, it can often be difficult and then we we often find that there's a pressure from marketing uh from these big companies that manufacture these as a marketing pressure and a demand to use their new implants but we need that needs to be backed up with solid data that this is going to be the right thing that lasts a very long time generally a knee replacement is held in your body with uh, what's called cement it's not cement it's actually a an epoxy resin that that, that helps the, the the metal implants bond with the bone um and uh whether or not we replace the undersurface of the kneecap as well that tends to vary from surgeon to surgeon and it generally depends on whether or not your kneecap is worn out or not if it isn't we leave it alone if it is then we resurface it um, symptoms of knee arthritis again pretty similar to the, the hip arthritis really it's pain that's the number one thing um, generally early on in the disease when the when the knee is beginning to wear out you tend to find that it's pain on doing certain things so demanding activities activities that have a high impact or that uh, involve a lot of twisting turning rapid acceleration deceleration change of direction that kind of thing you may experience some stiffness especially first thing in the morning uh, there may be some clicking and grinding sensations or some swelling in the knee what then tends to happen over time is those those symptoms will progress and the pain will become more dominant and the uh, you go from a situation where you only get pain with activity to getting pain with rest or at night time. You'll notice uh, deformity that we talked about before, and you'll notice that your your world shrinks. Essentially, your walking distance decreases. The the your activities, what you can do comfortably, um, will 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 diminish as well. And there will come a point at that that um, that life living with that worn out knee uh, no longer becomes acceptable and then we talk about uh, surgical treatments there are again before we go down that surgical route there are non-surgical treatments that we've spoken about before with the hip so activity modification uh, weight loss physiotherapy uh, strapping analgesia painkillers footwear changes exercise all of these things are incredibly important um, and can can help you live with a failing knee uh, for many years before you get to the stage where you end up needing surgery there are injections that can be performed into the knee as well there are injections of uh, lubricants and there are also injections uh, of steroids that can try and help calm down the inflammatory process inside the knee uh, there are other injections that are being developed at the moment. Uh, the Holy Grail, of course, is an injection that we can uh, do that will reverse or halt the degenerative process that's happening inside someone's knee. As I said previously, there is currently no cure for arthritis. Um, and the injections, the, 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 the things like uh, PRP or blood injections that, that are being developed and the the idea behind them is to try and be that cure for arthritis uh, unfortunately at the moment there is no scientific evidence that any of those newer injections make any significant difference to people in the long term especially people with established arthritis there may be um there may be an indication for very early arthritic change um but uh, that's you know the, the 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 evidence really isn't out there at the moment most of these injections uh the the new injections aren't funded by insurance companies either so it's um it's something that most people would have to fund from their own pocket and my general advice apart from in very special cases my advice would be that uh, i wouldn't waste my money on these new 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 injections just yet because there simply isn't the evidence to back it up um anyway surgically there are a, a few things that we can do i've highlighted the things that are available at benenden the uh, uh realigning your joints so breaking your legs to realignment what's called an osteotomy uh and uh, cartilage transplant again these are 
these are uh, specialist procedures that uh, are only performed in a few centres. Certainly in around the southeast of England, uh, it'd be very rare and not performed here at Benenden. The ones in bold we do perform here. Arthroscopic techniques, so keyhole surgery to try and um, minimise the, the, the symptoms, the mechanical symptoms that can come from arthritis uh, and try and help regenerate uh, some form of soft cartilage cover inside your knee, those things that we do here on a regular basis, and of course joint replacement surgery itself. Um, before knee replacement, again before hip replacement, um, sorry if I'm repeating myself here, but again it's all about uh, prehabilitation it's all about optimizing your health and keeping making sure that your muscles are as strong and as mobile as possible and again that the the, the, the pre-assessment process uh, the, the the nurse the physio the anesthetist is a similar process to what you what I've already described with uh, hip replacement um, Hip replacement, uh, there tends to be on, only one option there. That's a total joint replacement. With knee replacements, there are there are partial replacements as well as uh, uh, total knee replacements. Um, if if only one part of your knee is worn out, whether that be the, the, the inner part, the medial part, the lateral part, or even the, the kneecap joint at the front, if that's the only part of your knee that's worn and the rest of the knee is pristine and all the muscles and ligaments around that knee are normal, then you may be suitable for a, a, a partial knee replacement. Um, the advantage for a partial knee replacement is that it's you, you know, you, it's uh, less of an operation. Don't get me wrong, it's still a big surgery. It still involves a, a hammer and a saw in your leg, but it's um, uh, people tend to recover more quickly from partial knee replacements and the end result people tend to feel it feels more natural um, following a, a, a partial than a total knee replacement so if you are suitable for a knee replacement a, a partial replacement um, we will have that discussion in the clinic and if you agree that that's the right road that you want to go down then that's again something that we offer here at Ben um, total knee replacements uh, would be the other option and there's x-rays this person has had a partial knee replacement on the right and a conventional knee replacement on the left there are other options when it comes to surgery bigger than primary knee replacement they tend to be either for redo operations or when there's uh, severe deformity or significant amounts of muscle and ligament damage though I've put them in brackets because they're, they're they're operations that I perform but I don't perform them in in Benenden it's not that we, we we don't offer that service at Benenden Hospital so that would have to be performed elsewhere again after the operation the inpatient stay is focused on getting you up and about and getting you comfortable and mobile as quickly as possible Again, you'll have intensive physiotherapy. Again, you'll be working on your movement and your mobility. You will have the routine x-rays. You will have the blood tests. And again, you'll be in hospital one or two nights following the surgery. I must say, in my experience, it's more common for people who've had hip replacements to go home the day after. People with knee replacements tend to go home at two days. It can be a little tougher in the early stages following a knee replacement than a hip. Again, the risks of uh, the risks involved in knee replacement surgery fairly similar to to hip replacement um you, blood loss uh, damage to the bones or to the nerves again infection is mentioned at the top because it's important but not because it's common uh, again blood clots and i've spoken about the, the the mitigating factors that we put in place to avoid them um down at the bottom it says stiffness and swelling that's not a, a risk of a or a complication of a knee replacement that's a fact um you 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 will your knee will be stiff and swollen to start with that's that's part and parcel of of the early stages of a knee replacement operation but that swelling will settle and that stiffness will improve as as everything heals and matures again later on down the line knee replacements can wear out like i've said modern implants last decades Um, I've touched on a few innovations when we're talking about um, injections, but there are new technologies out there as well with regards to both hip and knee replacement surgery. Um, the first of which is a customized knee replacements. These are when um, the, the implant is built tailored specifically to uh, 
to you. Uh, the, we, we, there are customized knee and hip replacements. Um, these are a bit of a, a, again, these tend to be more of a sales gimmick than an actual treatment. There are rarely, there are people whose anatomy is so extraordinary or deformed that they have to have something built for them. But generally, you know, knee replacements come in multiple different sizes. Each of the components of a knee replacement comes in many different sizes. So our operating theatres stock multiple sizes, shapes, contours of, of knee and hip replacements. And, you know, for 99.9% .9 of patients, your, your implant is built for you in the hospital by choosing the, the right size sized and sided components for you having to have an implant built for you is an incredibly rare thing um, navigation uh, computer navigation and robotic surgery these are things that are again these are um, industry innovations to try to improve the accuracy and therefore the longevity and satisfaction from from hip and knee replacements this is one system here this is rosa rosa is a a knee robot who uh she can she can help me during an operation to to try and perform the surgery more accurately um it's it's not a robot performing your operation it is uh it is a, a mechanical arm that allows the placement of the cutting blocks to for me to perform the surgery in, with more accuracy um i have no doubt that over the next few years um robotic assisted surgery will become uh more and more mainstream and i think it's only a matter of time before this kind of surgery is performed uh in multiple uh, private hospitals and in Benenden. We currently don't perform this. The reason being that this is still in its experimental stages. At the moment, uh, the only genuine guarantee that I could give you with a robotic operation is that it will take longer to perform and it will cost you more money. There is no, at the moment, there is no evidence that it will result in you having a better joint replacement that will last longer or perform more well than the current conventional system these are first generation systems as the technology develops and matures over the years i think like i said this is going to be the future it's not there yet um, so it's something that uh, as a as a that orthopedic surgeons as a group are keeping a very close eye on i was at a conference yesterday when uh, the main focus of discussion was this kind of surgery and at the moment it goes in the experimental in very specialist units uh, area rather than being more of a mainstream thing but i've no doubt that that will change as things progress over the over the years um i'm not the only person here at benenden there are many of us here who perform hip and knee replacements here these are a rogues gallery of myself and my colleagues um, all of whom are eminently qualified and happy and amenable and uh, waiting to to uh, to help you out with your your hip or knee replacement most of us here specialize in both hips and knees there are a few uh, a, a couple on this list who only perform knee replacement surgery um, but you know, all of us are local people, local surgeons with a great deal of experience. And I'd be happy having my surgery performed by any one of them if I wasn't available. So there we go. Um, that's quite enough of me talking for now. I think we'll hand over for the for the Q&A session from now. Thank you, Mr. Sheffield. Um, as you say, we'll now take some questions. Um, starting with Angela. So, um, what is the aftercare for when you return home? Um, that depends what you mean, really, Angela. Um, the, the idea is that when you return home, you don't really need very much aftercare. That's the plan. Um, so, for example, your wound, we, we, we generally try to 
use uh, stitches that melt away and dissolve underneath your skin. What that means is that you don't need someone coming along every day or every other day to rip your dressing off, to look at your wound. You don't need someone to come along and take out your, your, your stitches. So the, the aim is for everything to be very low maintenance. Um, sometimes you will have surgical clips rather than the stitches if your if your skin is not uh, suitable for that and they will need to be removed at about 10 days or two weeks uh, after the surgery you're very welcome to come here for that but generally most people tend to uh, have that done by the practice nurse at their local gp surgery um there you you will be the you'll be given physiotherapy as an outpatient again that can either be local to you or you can come to to Benenden hospital to, to have that if if you are uh, local to us the other aftercare the the, the physiotherapy that is you you'll be given a, a, a booklet with advice and exercises and you will have the the ability to be able to ring up the hospital ring up the ward if you have any problems or, or worries or concerns and that's one of the advantages of being at Benenden Hospital that I found certainly compared to the other hospitals I work in especially in the NHS Benenden although we are a, a big busy high volume unit it's small enough that when you ring up you speak to someone you speak to a human being who can who can help um, and so there is aftercare from that point of view, generally, most people go home equipped with all that they need to get them through the, the, the first few weeks while they're recovering from the surgery. Thank you. Um, next question is, my mother is 89 and struggles with hip pain. Is there an age limit or risk to having it done at this age? And would she need it again? Um, short answer is no, there is no age limit. Um, like I said, uh, it, people have hip replacements at all ages uh, ultimately it boils down to rather than age it's fitness it's general health so the question would be you know if if your mother is healthy enough to have a hip replacement operation obviously having a hip replacement at Benenden Hospital is slightly different from having a hip replacement in, say, an NHS hospital. There is no intensive care facility here. So part of the pre-assessment process uh, before the surgery is to make sure that you're healthy enough to have the surgery here and to make sure that, it, that the risks are, are minimised. But no, um, 89 is just a number. What's much more important is your general health and whether or not um, you, it's safe to perform the surgery here. Will it need to be done again? That, well, that depends on how long you plan on living, really. Like I said, these last decades, and to be honest, most 89 year olds, um, it will see them out. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, I have heard of, ha of having a double hip. I have heard of having a double hip replacement. Would you operate on both at the same time? If so, would this affect my recovery? Um, it's quite tricky to operate on both at the same time because you're lying on one side, so you have to do one, then turn you over and do the other. Um, sorry, it is a it's a relatively rare thing for uh, to to do bilateral joint replacements in the same sitting. Um, I, I do it in my practice. I you know I, I do hundreds of these every year and the bilateral cases I do maybe one or two a year it's quite rare to be in a situation where both are equally affected and you are strong enough and healthy enough to be able to go through a double operation will it have an impact on your recovery um yes and no it is obviously it's a much bigger operation it's twice the size of the surgery so it, it is it takes you longer to get over having both hips done at the same time than it would having one hip done but it's quicker to get over having both hips done at the same time than having one hip done recover from it and then have the other hip done and recover from that so your combined hospital stay and recovery is shorter with a bilateral procedure uh, like i say it is it's a rare procedure to, to, to have done. It may be that your particular set of circumstances does mean that you're amenable to having that. I certainly do do perform that um, for people. Again, 
Another thing is whether or not it is safe and appropriate to have that surgery here at Benenden. Again, that really depends on your, your, your pre-assessment. So yes, it's possible. Uh, it's unusual, but possible. Um, you will recover quicker than you would do if you had two done separately, but it will take you longer than if you'd have just had one done. Thank you for that really comprehensive answer. Um, next question is, does Benenden Hospital offer payment plans for hip and knee replacements? Um, the answer to that is yes, yes they do. Uh, there's all sorts of payment plans available. Um, and if you speak to the, the private placement coordinators, uh, they will take you through all that as far as it goes. Thank you. Um, next question is, um, I'm 61 and still work full time. I have been recommended to have a knee replacement. I do quite a bit of heavy lifting at work. Would I still be able to do this after I have recovered? Um, if you are able to do that now, then it may well be that it's not quite the right time to have your knee replaced if you're, you know, it, it depends on the level of function that you're currently at. Um, but the, the, the short answer is, is yes, you should be able to, you're not going to be able to do it immediately. It's going to take you time. Like I mentioned, I recommend that people take three months off work. That's on average, that's everyone. And most people's work uh, can be fairly sedentary. If you are someone whose work is, is high demand or, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of lifting or manual work, then you may find that initially when you get back to work, you will be on uh, limited duties or restricted duties. Um, and it may take you longer to get back to the stage where you're fully functional. Um, but on the whole, if if the only thing that's holding you back is the, the worn out knee, if you can, once you've recovered from the surgery and once you've built up the strength and confidence in your muscles again, uh, and your knee is as strong as, as it ever was, then I can't see any reason why you can't get back to things. No. Thank you. Our next question is from Anne. Um, can you leave it too late for knee surgery? Um, it's quite, uh, it, no, really? Sorry. <laughs> the short <laughs> answer is no. Um, the long answer is that it's something, again, that would have been something that we'd have seen decades ago um, that where, where things are left to such extremes that the, that the joint is no longer reconstructable. Um, it's still something that you, when, uh, often, you know, you, people will, will, will travel overseas as part of their training or fellowship. And, you know, seeing uh, you, you see that kind of problem in the developing world. But in 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 the modern world with with the kind of technologies that we've got when it comes to joint reconstruction and replacement, um, I have never been in a situation where I've told someone that I cannot reconstruct their joint. Um, you, it's, it's advisable that you don't leave it so long that everything else around that joint becomes useless. So technically being able to reconstruct the joint is one thing, but the more the really important thing is having useful and functional muscles and ligaments and tendons around that knee so if you leave it to the stage where those muscles have withered away to nothing then yes technically you could leave it too late but from a from a purely surgical mechanical point of view no thank you very much um our next question is from richard is the route to treatment via a GP or direct to yourself? Uh, both uh, is the answer. Uh, GPs uh, tend to be the, 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 the gatekeepers uh, for referrals on to what we call secondary care or hospital care. Um, and it's whether that be uh, th via Benenden membership, via the NHS or even with a, with a private referral. Uh, a, the, 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 that process will start with your GP for a number of reasons. That, uh, part, you know, talking about all the, the steps that you normally go through before you're considering joint replacement surgery, that would, could be managed uh, locally before you got to me, if you see what I mean. Um, and another reason is that it's a, a GP referral not, on, not only will give you 
will give us the information about your particular condition but also it provides us with all your your previous medical history as well so so all the medications you're on every operation every hospital admission and consultation you've had will come through attached to that gp referral and that's all often quite useful and vital information when we're looking at the the rest of you uh we are you know, we are contactable uh, via you know directly. You can ring up the, the 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 private office, and I see people all the time who've self referred as well. And there's I don't have an issue with that. It may involve a few more tests before we get to the surgery uh, that would have otherwise been performed at, at the, at the pre hospital level. But no, by all means, we're we're work, uh, open to all comers really. Thank you. Um, next question is from Catherine. Um, does the pain in the hip flexor um, improve quickly after the hip replacement? Um, I've never had a hip replacement, so I can't answer from first hand experience. What I can do is tell you about the thousands of patients that I have operated on and give you some generalizations as far as hip replacements go. Um, I am, I continue to be surprised, amazed, delighted, call it what you want, at how rapidly people who've had hip replacements recover. They often describe, they, 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 as soon as they come around from the anaesthetic, they say, my pain has gone. The, the, the pain from that worn out hip, you know, it's really common that it will go. And that surprises me considering you know the the size of surgery that and you know what's involved in a hip replacement you know it's a, it's a big operation to go through and for people to be literally hours after their surgery say like andy uh, saying my pain is gone it, it, it's consistently um, impressive it, you will be sore from the operation there's no getting away from that but most people describe that pain as a, as a tightness or a stiffness rather than, uh, uh, you know, the pain that they came into hospital with. Uh, and the thing about the pain, post-operative pain is generally that tends to settle. Um, so any pain that you do have will settle as you heal. But the that initial pain doesn't always, but the vast majority of people who have hip replacements, they are really pleased uh, about how quickly that pain goes away. Thank you very much. Um, next question um, is from Jenny. I live in Northern Ireland. Is it okay to fly after surgery? Um, the, there, there are a few things when it comes to flying. Um, the first one is the, the logistics of flying. Um, sitting in a cramped economy class seat with high sides, putting pressure on your legs and your wounds, sitting in that position for an extended period of time will be uncomfortable and painful and difficult. Uh, the second thing, uh, but, but there are ways around that. Uh, the second uh, risk is a risk of developing blood clots. Uh, like we've said before, there's, you know, there is a risk of blood clot and that risk is increased by having joint replacement surgery. The other thing that uh, increases your risk of surgery is air travel. That combination of stasis, of pressure changes, of dehydration, and it's a perfect environment in an aeroplane to, to put you at a higher risk of a blood clot. Uh, generally, the advice that, uh, that we give that comes from the national, uh, national guidance when it comes to travel following joint replacement surgery is that you don't fly for six weeks following a hip or a knee replacement for the next six weeks so up to three months after the operation it's okay to travel short haul so four hours or less and then from three months onward unrestricted travel as with all of these things that is advice you can choose whether or not to follow that advice uh, no one's going to turn you away at the gate um, because you've had surgery sooner or later um, if i were you um in northern ireland um i would get the ferry across which is miserable but um at least you are not putting yourself at a, a higher risk and you can uh, walk around and stretch your legs your journey time may be longer but your risk of blood clot will be significantly less 
you very much. Um, and just our last question of the evening is from Linda. Um, I live two and a half hours away from Benenden. How will physiotherapist be arranged? Um, so, like I said, Benenden do offer physiotherapy at the hospital. A five hour round trip for that wouldn't really be sensible as far as I would suggest. Um, so the, the, the there are two options, really. Uh, and it's best that you ask this question now because it's something that you really need to arrange in advance. What you don't want to be do, doing is being discharged from hospital and then think, oh, crikey, I need some physiotherapy. Um, the, so there are two ways that you can do it. Number one would be through through arranging uh, physiotherapy through Benenden. Um, Benenden have a network of approved physiotherapists spread around the country and there may well be one that is local to you. That referral process will have to go through a head office in York and that's something that you would need to arrange through that. It's not something that can be arranged at this hospital then referring you to a Benenden physio locally. The other way to do that would be outside of Benenden and that would be via your either via your local GP or if you have a if there's a local private physiotherapist that you know or trust or that you have recommended to you, then you could always make make the make the arrangements yourself for that. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to everyone that's asked questions this evening. Um, if you would like to book your consultation, please do contact us on the number on screen before eight o'clock this evening or alternatively between nine to five, Monday to Friday. We are offering attendees 50% off an initial appointment with the terms that are shown on screen. You will receive a short survey after this presentation. So I, I would be grateful if you could spare a few minutes just to let me have your feedback on today's webinar. Our next webinar is on the 11th of October um, with our experts who will be discussing foot and ankle treatments. So on behalf of Mr. Alex Chipperfield, myself and the team at Benenden Hospital, I would like to say thank you very much for joining us this evening and we look forward to joining us at our next webinar. Thank you very much.